Okay, we're at section two, or session number two. And this is Apostolic Strategies, part one. And we're going to talk about the powers on earth. Uh, so I want to take a, a look here at the uh, basic powers that rule the world system. Other than angels, demons, and the Holy Spirit, all powers on earth can be reduced to three basic or general categories. These are the three greatest powers in the earth today. They would be violence, wealth, and knowledge. These three things can be either under satanic dominion or the church's dominion. Um, so if you can kind of picture a graph in your mind, it might help you to see that better. If you, if you pictured world systems across the top there, like world systems, and then under that you had three categories. Under world systems you have angels, demons, and the Holy Spirit. And then directly under angels, uh, demons, and the Holy Spirit, you have three categories, and those are violence, wealth, and knowledge. Now that's basically how it's broken down. And that's how things all pan out. So, what you have in the earth is you have violence, wealth, and knowledge. And uh, it's either going to be controlled by satanic dominion or the church's dominion. And so if you think about it for a minute, it's, it, it's, uh, it's almost overwhelming. You know, Three primary or three basic realms where there's power and control in the earth. So the world is moved by the, in, act, the interactive powers of violence, wealth, and knowledge. When the power of God is entered into the equation, something quite different begins to happen. So if we look at violence first, so what happens when violence is under satanic dominion? Uh, Tung, author and leader of the Communist Revol Revolution, was asked, how do you control a billion people? And he said, power is what comes out of the end of a gun. In other words, masses of people can be controlled by violence. Violence as a form of control is prevalent in our society. It's seen from our schoolyards to corporate boardrooms as bullying in its various forms. Media is continually reporting violence in all its forms, which occurs in our families, cities, regions, nations, and internationally. The world is filled with violence. Not all violence is evil. There is such a thing as, just, uh, as a just and a righteous cause. And the church has a way to overcome violence. Excuse me. Uh, not with a natural sword, but to conform the power of violence to the spiritual sword, which is the word of God. So uh, here's the thing about violence. It's, it, it's a power in the earth today. Uh, you think about um, Islam, Al-Qaeda and um, ISIS. and uh, That's what that's all about. The reason they are so grossly violent is because uh, they know that it controls people. And they know that the more graphic and the more horrifying that they can be, the more control that they can, you know, have. Because nobody wants their head cut off. I mean, let's just be honest. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and it's working for them. I mean, our government is afraid of them. Uh, and so our people are afraid of them because... Bottom line is, is if you don't have, uh, if you don't feel safe, and you see crazy people like that, what do you have? You have control. You know, it's it's an element that uses fear. We live on campus at Christ for the Nations. It just so happens that we live uh, in a safe environment because the whole campus is fenced in. You know, with iron fence. But 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 CFNI is in Oak Cliff, which is in, you know, it's the most dangerous part of Dallas. And we just happen to live on the perimeter of the campus, our apartment, with our outside bedroom window to the outside of the campus. Now, we're safe in there, but we hear all the gunshots at night, all the stuff that's going on right off campus, right outside our window. I'm, I'm talking about this is almost, almost every night we hear gunshots. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very dangerous, not on campus. But right outside our window. <laughs> you know, in other words, if we crawled out our window at nighttime, we'd be in danger, basically, because of all the drug deals and all the gunfights that go on 
right outside our window because outside our bedroom window is off campus. Outside of our front door is on campus. Y'all get the picture? We're safe because we don't go out our window. <laughs> but, uh, um, but people stay out of that part of the town at night because it's so dangerous. Uh, if you have the wrong skin color or if you drive a car that looks like it's within the last five years new, you know, or old, um, you're going to probably get, you know, robbed or something because it's, it's a bad part of town. Well, um, violence is power. Wealth. Wealth is a higher power than violence because money can buy violence. If the church had greater wealth, she would have greater influence. When the United States won the Cold War, it put Russia in dire economic straits. President Reagan strategized to start an arms race because it cost a great deal of money to develop planes, submarines, ballistic missiles, tanks, and so forth. And we have a lot more money than they do. The arms race had nothing to do with arms. It had to do with money. The whole idea was to sink the Soviet Union financially. Another Reagan strategy was devised when he went to the director of the CIA and asked, how can we beat the Soviet Union? And the reply was, Levi Jeans. <clears throat> Make the people want Levi Jeans, stereos, makeup, and other American goods and products. When a nation becomes consumer-oriented, it forces them to become capitalist. Consequently, the people will be dissatisfied with communism and start to look at other ways to generate income. And that will economically destroy the communist governmental system. Um, that's interesting, but you know what? It's true. People, um, people are funny. That's, that's, that's how presidential races are won if, uh, sometimes. That's how they have been won. All about the economy. In other words, Christian people, uh, it's sad to say, but Christian people sometimes will vote if they think someone is going to put more money in their pocket irrelative if it's irrelative to them that that same someone may abort children, may stand for ungodly principles, uh, things of that nature. It's, it's all about wealth. It's about money. And uh, it's a sad thing. Amen? Amen. I know of a particular college. I, I, re I read some statistics, college statistics and things, about um, how to uh, get students, you know, because I'm I, with Integrity Seminary, you know, I'm... I'm searching those types of things. And I, I read a survey and a, a little bit of research on uh, one of the top for-profit colleges and how that they um, reached their level of such a high enrollment and such a high profit margin for a particular year. I think it was 2013. And it was because to every student that enrolled, they give away a tablet, uh, you know, uh, I, what do you call it, iPad? A tablet. They give you. They give every student a, an iPad tablet, and uh, well, they have a choice of an iPad tablet or uh, uh, a uh, laptop. Well, you know, a laptop. Uh, if you enroll, and so you get you get a, a five hundred dollar laptop or whatever a tablet costs, which is probably in the same neighborhood price wise. Uh, here's the funny thing about it: that that's credited basically as their marketing strategy that brought them so high. And a phenomenal amount of students and um, uh, profit margin that year. Here's the funny thing about it: they were they were they were in the uh, top five percent of most expensive schools, online schools. Uh, it's called Concordia. <laughs> People paid three or four thousand dollars for a four or five hundred dollar computer. Yeah. <laughs> they paid three or four thousand uh, dollars uh, more for that college to go to that college to get a five thousand dollar computer. Are you getting it? Come on. Uh, it's you know it's 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 nonsense. People don't think it's just you know if they think they're getting something free, it's all called marketing is what it is. And that's what the article was, was saying, you know. It's like, um, uh, I don't remember exactly what they were saying, but they were saying not only did they have, the, not only were they in the top echelon of em, student enrollment, their, and their profit margin overall was in the top, very top percentile, but they, they also, 
they, they also made a killing off free computers. <laughs> you know, uh, and it's because people are so hungry for something for free. You know, wealth. It's like, you know, give me something. Something that I want, you know. Something that, and, and yet, they don't think. And that's how the devil uh, rules over people with wealth and finances and money and stuff. People will, that's why our student debt is astronomical in this country. It's just unbelievable. Uh, people who had knowledge and who also had wealth, uh, as it was referred to, overcame the threat of the evil empire without firing a shot. <laughs> it, it's a fact. Uh, you know, so this is referring to Reagan and his, some of his decisions that was made here we read about in the arms race. And it's a fact that uh, if you've got enough money, you can avoid a lot of things. If you've got enough money, you can uh, control a lot of things. And that's just, that's just a fact in the whole matter right there. Jesus taught more about money than he did on faith or prayer. Of the 38 parables, 16 deal with money and or possessions. In the four Gospels, 268 verses deal with money and possessions. While there are 500 verses that speak about prayer and 500 verses about faith, there are 2,000 verses about money and possessions. We have to assume that how we handle money and possessions is important to the Lord. We have to have the knowledge of this world concerning the function and the methodology of money in order to reign in this world. We learn from Jesus' parable of the talents that he expects us to be kingdom builders with all the gifts, talents, and money that he has given us. The command of the Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations. To make a disciple of an entire nation means that everything within that nation will have to be transformed to conform to the Word of God. Schools, politics, economics, culture, and so forth. That's a large undertaking that's going to take a lot of money. Can I say something to you? That is the very philosophy that Islam has? Yes, it is. It is. And they're not shameful about it. They don't try to hide it. They make it known publicly to everybody the first day they show up. We're going to dominate. We're going to take over everything. Your education system, your banks. We're going to take over your legal system. We're going to take over everything. We're going to control your minds. We're even going to tell your wife what she's going to wear. Yeah. And you know what? It makes a lot of Christians cringe to hear this said, but that's really supposed to be kingdom culture's position. It really is. We're supposed to determine the culture. Not legalistically, but holiness, righteousness, amen, joy, peace. How many of you know? We're supposed to, we're supposed to say to Islam, no, you won't. We're supposed to say to, uh, uh, you know, to um, sin and unrighteousness and perversion and all these uh, things of the devil. No, you won't. You can't anymore. Because this is God's kingdom. Amen? This is God's kingdom. Amen? That's what this is all about. Amen? So, um, the command of the Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations. To make a disciple of an entire nation means that everything within that nation will have to be transformed to conform to the Word of God. Everything. Schools, politics, economics, and culture. Uh, wealth is for the purpose of establishing the covenant of God, not our own consumption, although we do get our share of what God allows to pass through our hands. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. This needs to be every one of our, us, this needs to be our motto. You know, that God, everything that God uh, gives to me, He has given to me and entrusted me that, it, that I might set forth to establish His covenant covenant. Amen? Uh, because that's what it's about. God's about setting up His kingdom in the earth. And I believe that as we, as we begin to internalize this scripture right here and begin to make it a part of what we truly are about, that God will begin to send wealth our way. God will begin to send favor our way. God will begin to send resources our way so that we can channel and so that we can manage them for His kingdom and for His glory. 
And yes, God, God knows that you have needs. God knows that you have things in your life that need to be done and accomplished and taken care of. But He, he also knows that uh, He needs people to manage His resources in the earth. Amen? And I believe God's looking for men and women in the kingdom so He can get this whole program underway. I really do. Amen? Apostles are part of God's method of transferring the wealth of the wicked to the righteous. Apostolic churches will have finances to accomplish the purposes of God, that God has called them to. Scripture says the wealth of the wicked will be transferred to the righteous. That's Proverbs 13, 22. Watch this, watch this. We see a transfer of wealth in the ministry of Jesus in the case of Zacchaeus. Remember the story. Amen? Uh, and in Levi, too. Luke 19, 2 through 3, 8, and 5, 27 through 28. You remember Zacchaeus told the Lord that he was giving half of his possessions to the poor. And if he cheated anybody, he was going to pay back four times the amount. That is a transfer of finances from one kingdom back into the kingdom of, of God. Amen? This is the kind of stuff that God wants to do today. Amen? And this is why we've got to get about the Great Commission because as we begin to reach these people of influence and these people of means, and basically, you know what? A lot of it, I, I'm not judging people because I don't have anybody in mind, you see. But a lot of it has been obtained through illegal and ungodly means and ways, just like it was in these cats, amen? <laughs> and so when they come to Christ, they're going to come with a true repentant heart. And they're going to come and they're going to say, hey, I want to restore uh, this back where it belongs, back into the kingdom of God, amen? Uh, Levi, which is Matthew, he got up from his tax booth and he left everything to follow Jesus. This is a man who used to steal from the poor, amen? This was a tax collector. You know what a tax collector was. He went about collecting tax, but he always added a tax to the tax. Tax for his own pocket, amen? And uh, these are the kind of people that God is reaching out to today to redeem their souls, amen? And, and not only that, but He wants to redeem their finances. God wants to take what's in their, in their pockets and what's in their hands, and He wants to redeem it and place it back into the kingdom of God where it belongs. Amen? Uh, the, th the next thing is knowledge. Knowledge is power. It's always been said that holding back knowledge is control. When Chairman Mao uh, took over China, the first thing he did was shut down the university so that he could gain control of the people. The greatest thing an oppressed people can do is become educated. The more educated a group becomes, the harder they are to control. That's why I always tell people, you've got to get an education. You, you know, and boy, I tell you, Christians are some of the hardest. You know, brother, I, all I need is the Lord. He'll guide me. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, you know, it's like ignorance just bleeding out of them all over. And look, man, I'm, I'm not just saying you, you just need the world to... I'm saying you need an education from God's Word. You need an education from the wise men and women of God. You need an education uh, just by rubbing shoulders with people, you know, and learning from their experiences in life. And yes, you do need an education from the educational systems of the world, not to twist you or pervert you, but so that you can understand the twisted minds of men, so that you can communicate with them, so that you can speak on their level. You will never know how ignorant you are until you learn something. No, it's the truth. The more I learn, the, the more I realize how stupid I am. But here's the thing, and I'm telling on myself, but here's the thing. I didn't know how arrogantly stupid I was until I started learning. Some of the things we believe, some of the, good Lord, some of the things we teach people, some of the things that we, we will fight for. Amen. I'm talking about even sometimes from the pulpit. You know? Listen, the smarter you get, the harder it is to deceive you. Too many times Christian people have stood in the pulpit or, or, or in front of a Sunday school class and we have just preached and taught, you know, stuff that we really believed in our heart was right. And, and, and the truth is we had no idea what we were talking about. But we were going to believe it until we died. I can tell you myself, there are many, many things that I used to believe wholeheartedly that I just don't believe today because I learned they weren't true. But I let well-meaning people teach me those things. You know? 
And, and, then, then, the, and then there are things today that, uh, that uh, I didn't believe back then that I do believe today. Because I studied, you know? Because I found it in the Word of God. Or I, or I learned it somewhere or something. And so it, it takes... It takes um, it takes making a sacrifice. It takes making an effort. You know, Proverbs says, by education. There's a reason. Number one, is anything worthwhile will cost you. But also, if you educate yourself, it will make you a better person. Amen? It really will. I promise you, it ain't going to hurt you to learn something. Amen. 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 So knowledge. Amen. Conclusion. Apostles grow in knowledge and will be given wisdom and strategies by the Holy Spirit to accomplish their God-given goals. As they teach the churches, godly principles are being restored and put into action by believers. Tithes and offerings will increase in order to support the church and fulfill the purposes of God. As the church rises to her proper governmental position, we will impact our society to change the moral character of an ungodly world. Think about this this way. And I know somebody is, is not going to take this right, but think about this way. God's able to bless what you sow, right? You know what I'm saying? If I don't sow a seed, God can't bless that seed. I can't get no, I can't get no blessed harvest on my watermelon if I don't sow a watermelon seed, can I? It was the same in our lives. If we don't educate ourselves, if we don't get training in certain areas, if, if, if you're working a job and you've been praying to God for a promotion and you want a promotion and the only promotions that are available is for jobs where you need more training. But bless God, I'm, God's going to promote me. Well, you know what? Do you know how to run that lathe? Do you, know, do you know how to fix that diesel engine? Well, then you're going to keep sweeping the floor until you learn how. Guess what? God can't promote you to a job you can't do. But, you know, people are like that, though. You know? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm God, you know, I'm, I'm the blessed of the Lord. Yes, you are the blessed of the Lord. God loves you. And God wants to bless you. And you may get a new, new broom next week. Hello? And it might be easier to push. That may be your promotion. You know why? Because that's all that you've sown to. You've been faithful to push that old, that old wore out broom that won't, won't work halfway. And you've been working twice as hard and you may get a new broom next week. But you know what? You're not going to get a promotion to the head mechanic because you can't fix a bicycle. You know, in other words, how many of you hear what I'm saying? But, but sometimes, it's, sometimes people, even Christian people, they just don't seem to get it. You know, you want to move up? Then work twice as hard. I want one of them boss's jobs where you just sit in a chair. Listen, what that boss does in that chair is far beyond your comprehension. Hello? It's far beyond your comprehension. Sometimes working with your back is physically tiring. And that's sometimes that's all that person who works with his back can comprehend. Because he's never ever applied himself or been willing to learn how to do mathematical problems, how to do bookkeeping, how to do research. How many of you hear what I'm saying? And those things are very taxing on the mind and on the back in that chair. And it goes on for hours and hours. And, and it took a lot of years in school and preparation. And that's why the guy sitting in the chair gets to sit in the chair because it's tiring on that computer and, and, and all that figuring. And he spent years getting to that place. Hello, and he spent years in education paying for it. Well, how are we going to take the kingdom if all I can do is get minimum wage and I'm down here digging holes all the time? Well, I don't know. Well, you got any ideas? Well, God needs to promote me. God will. What are you going to do? Well, God needs to do it. Well, what are you going to do? See, we have this mentality sometimes. Y'all know this is for them people on the video, right? Sometimes we have this mentality that I was born into this earth and, you know, it's just a... Um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you just give everything to me? Entitlement. Entitlement. You know, I'm on God's government program. Entitlement. Yeah. There you go. I'm on God's government program. This is the kingdom program. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, I better get off that. Yeah, but, you, but it's not that way, is it? You know, you have to work hard and apply yourself and, 
And, and uh, if you want to be something and have something in the things of the Lord, then you've got, you got to show up and you've got to work hard, don't you? Yeah. But it will pay off. Because God is an honoring God. He's a precious God. Amen. Amen. So that's a good thing, isn't it? I'm sorry if I got a little bit of meddling going on there, but I think it all fits in here somehow. I think it does. We'll talk about the governing church as the territorial church. So, um, so Hebrews 9, 8 through 10 says, The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with food and drink and various washings and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So the scripture indicates here that regulations for the body were imposed until the time of reformation. So the Old Testament washings and sacrifices were okay for the Old Testament, but not for this day. Jesus as a reformer, and in this day we need reformation of his body, which is the church. Some characteristics of this governing church are that it conducts spiritual warfare, uh, and we know that it takes an army to defeat an army, right? Amen. That's what they've been trying to convince our president. Excuse I mean, me. okay. Uh, so, rising into the spirit to dislodge the powers of darkness, this is what a governing church does. A governing church is a church that rises in the spirit realm and dislodges powers of darkness over that region and positions herself to rule and reign. See, I know that for years we, we taught a lot and there was a lot talked about uh, the strong man, talked about strongholds. And it was always uh, alluded to the devil having a stronghold over, you know, southeast Oklahoma, the strong man, and we would identify a spirit maybe over southeast Oklahoma or something. But let's talk about the church being that. Amen? Let's talk about the church of Jesus Christ being the strong man. The church of Jesus Christ being the stronghold. What if, and I believe it is to be this way, that the apostolic church arises over the area in the spirit realm, in spiritual warfare, and takes its dominion and its authority, and the kingdom of darkness can't come in. Amen? The kingdom of darkness is in an upheaval. And all through the realm of darkness, there's a commotion up there that's saying, hey, you know, we, 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 can't, we can't maneuver down there anymore. We're not able to affect that area. You know, we used to have a, a stronghold down there in the area of, of, of uh, substance abuse. And we used to be able to really work in some of the families down there with this old uh, problem of divorce and incest and, 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 and all these other uh, family issues. For generations, we used, to, we used to have that thing nailed down, but we can't get in there anymore well why, why not you know why not well that those churches down there got a stronghold those churches down there set themselves up in the spirit realm we can't break in no more we can't get in there they're united and they're locked together in the spirit realm we can't get in there no more wouldn't that be powerful well, you know what that's where we're going amen that's where God's taking us glory to God and I'm going to tell you what I believe all hell is upset Glory to God, but there's nothing they can do about it. Amen? Amen. So they possess a kingly anointing and authority to execute kingdom rule and judgment over the powers of the air. They reposition uh, themselves to become the stronger man, becoming the stronger man over the strong man of the city, bringing down enemy strongholds and uh, overrules, overruling the activities of the enemy, exercising a new spiritual position, becoming the territorial spirit of the region, exercising territorial control and influence over the region. It takes a government to replace a government. Amen? Praise God. I tell you what, I'm liking this. Whew, this ain't the first time I've, I've taught this either, and I'm still liking it. Amen. So the governing church becomes the gate or entrance point for God and his angelic host to reach into that city and region. See, here, here's why we mention this. Because it ain't the gate for the devil no more. He don't get access. So Because now we've got open heavens for the Lord and his activity, but we close the door to the devil, amen? Glory to God. 
Thank you, Jesus. So the keys of the kingdom to bind and loose are given to the church. It keeps the heaven open and the enemy blocked from the region. It has the power to open and shut doors in the region, taking responsibility to keep spiritual climate uh, climate conducive for God to move, bringing not only God's um, not presence, but His manifested presence into the region. It's not measured by numbers, but by spiritual position. Supernatural strength and power invested in them by becoming the greatest demonstration of the kingdom of God in the region. You don't, you don't have to have a thousand Christians. You just need what you got. Amen. Because it's about authority. It's about who you are in the Spirit. Amen? So the church is the Christ that the world sees. Governing churches carry a clear message of the gospel which creates stirring in the believer's hearts, resulting in great spiritual growth and deep convictions through meaningful covenant relationships that will raise up those who will pursue the vision and the call of their forefathers. The cycle of restoration, reformation, and revival breaks forth when the church is stirred by this revelation of God's purposes. The governing church becomes God's instrument to reform the very nature and foundation of the society she lives in. When this momentum begins to take place, and when the church is set in the heavenlies in her proper position, and she has the authority, all of a sudden the atmosphere, or I should say the environment, is changed. And things begin to flow in a new direction. And that is the direction that the Spirit of the Lord is wanting to move in. Because the resistance is down. And now, there's a whole different thing going on on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And it doesn't just stop when the service stops. It's a move of God in the community and among the peoples. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, building the governing church. In the past, the church was built somewhat haphazardly by trial and error. We live to suffer the trials uh, at, that came because of our errors. As the church matured, she was built by, uh, built by uh, instinct and inspiration. And soon it was realized that building a church was not just inspiration, but also perspiration and hard work. And then we started to build by intuitive knowledge. The church growth took place when we heard God's voice clearly, and then it stagnated when we had mixture. Inability to hear clearly made building by spirit, instinct, difficult and uncertain. Well, I'll tell you what, when, when, when I cover that part... Um, like I said, this isn't the first time I've taught this. It, it always speaks to me. I think, you know, because I'm, 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 I have been young and now I'm old. <laughs> David, you know, said, and I've never seen the righteous for saying, I think about my life and I think about the places I've pastored and the churches I've been in and the good things I've seen God do. And then I think of the struggles we had. And I think about exactly that. I think about how many times I led by instinct and I didn't have the clearest pattern. You know what I mean? I knew what God wanted to do, and I set out to do it, and I did it with the best ability I had, but I made a lot of mistakes. You, you know what I'm saying. I made a lot of mistakes. I, uh, I did the best I could. I did some things in faith, and I did some things by instinct, and I did some things by natural knowledge, and God blessed it, and we did good things, but at the same time, I made mistakes, and sometimes I hurt people. Sometimes I hurt myself. Sometimes I, uh, I, I, I spent money I could have saved. Some uh, Y'all know what I'm saying? It's like, it, and I look back, and I think, oh man, oh man, oh man, <laughs> you know, and it's painful, and uh, and I regret things, and and wish I could go back and do things different, but you know, but I really see as a result of it. Look over my life, and I and I, I look and I go, but you know, by God's grace, let me learn from it. Let just let me learn from it, God. You know, H help me to learn from it. Help me to 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 come to exactly what we're talking about here. Help me to. Begin to learn from my mistakes. Help me to learn. But by, by everything, Lord, help me to get that mixture out. You know, I want to become more clear. And, and, and I want to just hear what the Spirit says. I don't, want, I, I don't want to move forward at this point in my life where it's a little bit of me and a little bit of the Holy Spirit and a little bit of instinct and a little bit of, well, uh, you know, just you, Lord, you know, I've had enough of that other stuff. You know, um, 
And I just think that this is where God's taken us. Maturity brought the realization that it is wisdom that builds the house. Um, Proverbs 24, 3-4 says, says that through wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. You know, I, maybe some of it's my age, but also I just see now that you know, as, as life passes, you, you, know, you want to slow down a little bit, you want to you look a little closer, you want to count the cost, you want to you you think twice before you act, you still want to build the house, you still want to do what God's ca- called you to do, but it's, just, it's like everything, time is shorter, everything's more important, what you do now counts more. I don't know. Y'all, do y'all feel like that? Am I the only old man here? I don't know. You know. <laughs> uh, so we need to build by destiny and strategy. The concepts for building churches are set out in Acts. The apostles operated on the principles which were functional within the concepts of their minds. Different apostles built according to the different concepts that they possessed. When the progressive revelation of the Holy Spirit came, the paradigms of their thought patterns are also changed. Borders of thinking enlarged, breaking the former religious and cultural boundaries. The apostles were graced with wisdom to unlock hindrances and supervise the building of the churches through to conclusion. So God will reveal His secret counsel to the prophet who is responsible to initiate God's will and plans on the earth. Now Amos 3.7 says... Surely the Lord does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. Amen. Praise God. Through insight and revelation, the prophet brings understanding and clarity to God's revealed word and will so that it is relevant in its time and place. Teachers provide necessary detailed knowledge of God's principles so that the revealed will of God is properly executed on the earth. He explains and brings a sense of undergirding to the spoken truth. The spoken word establishes the people in their spirits while the explanation of it puts a sense of certainty in their minds. So are you seeing what's happening here? Fivefold ministry is now involved in the movements of the Spirit, in the building of the church. It's not just one person trying to move out and accomplish a task. But you've got the voice of the teacher, the voice of the prophet. You've got the voice of the different ministries speaking forth and giving input, which is bringing balance and wisdom to the whole concept of building the church. Uh, Essential principles in building the governing church. Leadership must build according to the present day divine patterns. Um, the scripture says here in Hebrews 9, 2 through 4, and also verse 8, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold in which were, which were the golden pot that had the manna. Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the gold. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. And then we move to Exodus 25 verse 9. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So we're reading here that the heavenly blueprint of the tabernacle has been changed because the position of the altar of incense which had been in the holy place has been changed. The pattern that was previously shown to Moses underwent change because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The altar of incense is now in the holy of holies signifying that our worship, prayer, and intercession has taken on a spirit dimension and God can now be reached and touched by those who are living and walking in the Spirit. Uh, John 4, 23 and 24, familiar passage to all of us. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And then Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, another familiar passage. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, 
being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So if we're building the tabernacle today, we would need to build it according to the heavenly pattern as it is seen in heaven today and not as it was in the past. Leadership has to build with the future in view. A church with the future in its perspective will stay relevant to future generations. Leadership must be spiritually positioned to build. They must be men and women who walk by the Spirit. That means they must learn how to build into the spirit realm by learning to maneuver in the spirit realm. They must be prophetically tuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit so they can know what he's saying to the churches without a clear heavenly blueprint and anointing. No pastor can build a successful governing church. The days of building by technique transfer are over. Technique transfer is basically how'd you do it, you know? Oh, okay, let's go do it the way he did it. And you know, this was real big around the turn of the millennium. A lot of church growth conferences. Everybody wanted to hear how Rick Warren did it, and how this one did it, and how that one did it, who all did it big. The problem was is people would go back to their church and do it, and it wouldn't, do, it wouldn't work out the same. And that's because technique transfer doesn't always work for you. you they got it from God. And you can use some people's techniques and it might help to a degree. But you really have to hear from God because every community is different, every church is different, and every vision is different to some degree. Um, 1 Chronicles 29.2 says, Now for the house of my God I have prepared with all my heart, might gold for the things to be made of gold, silver for the things of silver, bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx, stones, Stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. The point being that what works for one house may not work for your house because your house may not be made of stone and onyx. You may have something else in your house. In other words, people, because the stones in the house are the people in the house. And so the needs in the house and the giftings in the house, the stones are going to be different in different houses. And so you're going to have to build your house as the Spirit speaks. And the Spirit will say, for this kind of stone, you need this stone. And for this kind of stone, you need this stone. And for this, you need this. And so you have to listen to the Spirit, right? Amen? So leadership must gather the necessary resources to build. We need the right materials to put into the work. The personal life of the builder must be wholesome, remembering that David built his own house first before he built a place for the ark. That's First uh, Chronicles 15.1. And that's a real good principle right there, is that uh, you've got to build your own house first. Not talking about physical houses like David's was a physical house. We're talking about spiritual house. Build your own relationship with Jesus first. Build your own house first. Do you understand? Yeah. Amen? Build your own house first. Your own relationship with God. Build your own house first before you build the house of God. Amen? I think everybody understands. Uh, so many concepts spiritually, are caught and not necessarily taught. Builders must be where they can catch the flow of the spirit life and anointing for the work that they are in. We need also to gather those who are of the same spirit to help us according to the God-given vision. Uh, pastor Billy is not only a pastor, he is a contractor and a roofer. And uh, I've owned businesses and I've also been in management working for other people, and I know that uh, Brother Terry is a businessman, and some of the rest of you, Tammy's been a business person, some of the rest of you have done stuff, I know, uh, uh, Lorinda's a businesswoman, uh, the rest of y'all are into something, I know, I can look at you and tell, uh, or you're up to something, and, uh, uh, so, and you know what we're saying right here, is you can hire somebody that knows how to do the job, Okay, they might say, I know how to do logging. They might say, I know how to roof a house. But that's one thing. And that really helps a lot when they come to work. At least you, you don't have somebody out there green that don't even know, you know, the first thing about it. But what you also want is for them to catch your flow of things, 
your spirit, the way you do things. Because they may get up there, and yes, they may know how to do the trade or the business, but if they can't catch the way you do it, you know, where some things are taught and some things are caught, if they can't catch a hold of the way you do it, they're going to slow you down and the rest of your crew, and by the end of the day, it don't make any difference how much knowledge they have and how much skill they have. If they slowed you down, they costed you money, and you're not sure you want them back tomorrow. Not because they don't know how to do the job, but because they're not willing to catch on to the way you do things. When I was a kid, uh, actually I was, uh, it was my first year in college. While I was at college, I worked at Pizza Hut for a few months, and then I went home for the summer. When I went home for the summer, there was a Pizza Inn. Actually, I think I got it backwards. Anyway, what, I worked at Pizza Inn, then I went to home for summer, and I wanted to get a summer job, so I went to Pizza Hut, which was right down by the house, and I applied for a job, and they hired me. And he said, uh, he said I noticed you worked for, for uh, Pizza Inn. And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I, I, and I thought, you know, I got experience. You know, you should really be glad to have me. And he said, well, the first thing I want you to do is forget everything you know. That's what he said. And I, and I got a little put back, you know. He said, I want you to forget everything you know. He said, this is Pizza Inn. And we don't do things like Pizza Hut. He said, I want you to do things the way we do them. And this is the principle right here. When it comes to ministry, when it comes to building the house of God, in whichever church, whatever church God puts you in, whatever ministry, when God starts building His house, there are some things that are taught, but then there are, there are some things that are caught. And when it comes to the things that are caught, you need to be willing to catch. Amen. Get your catcher's mitt out. Amen. You need to be willing to catch. You need to be willing to flow with the house. You need to be willing to get the spirit of the house like God took of Moses' spirit and put it upon the 70. You need to let God take of the spirit of the chief elder, the pastor, the apostle, whatever, the team, whoever the leaders are, the spirit of the house. And you need to let God take of that and you need to catch that. Okay? You don't come in and say, well, you know, uh, well, this is how we did it where I came from. And don't nobody care. They don't care, you know. Uh, you, you can be nice and say, you know, sometimes I, I have a suggestion, but just remember it's a suggestion. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Uh, you, but primarily, you are there to be a blessing and to catch on to the way things are done. And because God builds His house in different ways at different places. It's the same house. It's God's house. But that's why God has different churches in different places, in communities and in cities and states and all over the place. Is because they relate to Him in special ways. And as they do, they appeal to different people in the community and in different things. And that don't make anybody right or wrong or anybody better than the other guy. It just is the way it is. Anybody get an amen for that? Amen. All right. Amen. And then there are things that are taught. Amen. First Chronicles 29, 6 says, And then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work offered willingly. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. So that's a wonderful thing and a great thing, is that we always going to offer ourselves willingly in the building of the house of the Lord. Amen. Uh, number five, leadership must develop apostolic wisdom to manage and organize what has been built. To manage and organize what has been built. So it's an establishment of apostolic structure and it helps to maintain, contain, and propagate the revival and the move of God within a church. A lack of governing structure will hinder the flow of God's chain of authority. And a lack of biblical structure will cause people to be postponed wrongly and functioning in areas where God has not placed them. It's a funny thing, but it's a true thing. Revival has broken out ever since Jesus walked the earth, you know, at different times. And every time it has ceased to continue because of an improper structural governmental uh, uh, placement, I'll call it, of what we're talking about here. I'm, I'm just thinking about some more recent situations. 
Um, and it seems like men are scared of men. Um, it seems like whenever God's using someone to bring revival, the others that are there who are supposed to be in realms of authority to balance each other and to keep, to, to keep one another you know, uh, within the, the perimeters of what's sound and what's right, uh, become fearful of the one who God's using, and it almost always leads to the cessation of the move of God. And we've got to trust each other more than that. First of all, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we've got to trust that God holds us responsible if we don't help each other stay focused on what we're supposed to be doing, amen, and doing it right. And uh, we've got to trust that, uh, well, it goes both ways is all I'm trying to say, you know. I'm thinking about the revival in Florida. Uh, Todd Bentley. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, somebody should have helped him. That's all I'm saying, you know. Somebody should have helped. Somebody right there with him should have helped him. And, uh, but people, be, people get scared, you know, but God's using him. I don't want to touch God's anointing, you know. God's using him and, you know, no. Uh, yeah, it's awesome that God's using somebody, but we need to remember that the reason God forms five-fold ministry teams is so we can keep each other in balance so that we can, you know, set up some structure and some guidelines to protect each other. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And all it does is it helps each other in a situation like that. But this is the case usually in every situation and, and uh, if we would just follow some simple principles we sure would be a blessing to each other and uh, we would we would probably prolong what God's doing in our midst if we would do it probably so apostolic management will cause leaders and members to become functional rather than positional and really this word is my favorite word functional you know we said it earlier functional positional is not the point who cares who's got the highest title you know <laughs> who cares who's got the fanciest title um, uh, that is not the point to God. It, it, it is not about positions, it's about function. Uh, it, it was after the temple of Solomon was properly organized and functioning, the glory of God descended on it. It's about function, it is not about position, is it? Amen. So, in conclusion, God is raising up a governing church to rule and reign over their region. Governing churches will conduct spiritual warfare and bring down the enemy strongholds over their regions. They will become... Uh, the territory of strong men over the region so that the Holy Spirit can flow unhindered to minister and bring salvation and restoration to the lives of the people of the region. Carries a clear gospel of the kingdom message which will result in greater spiritual growth